The business is sponsored by Kingston Smith Chartered Accountants. Hello and welcome to The Business. I'm Roma Bomick with the show that's essential listening for the West Hearts business community. Our theme for tonight is finance fitness. It takes money to make money, so they, the saying goes. Businesses have to consider their finances for any number of reasons, ranging from that first pot of money to start up, survival in bad times, to bolstering the next success in good ones. How you finance your business can affect your ability to grow. You might need to employ staff, purchase goods, acquire licenses or develop new products and services. While finances are not necessarily as important as vision and a great product, they're crucial to making the good stuff happen. So what are some of the many options and what tips are there for staying finance fit? In the studio tonight, we're delighted to have Sylvia Vitiello, partner at Kingston Smith, a top 20 firm of chartered accountants and leading advisors to entrepreneurial businesses and, of course, sponsors of our show. We also have Ronnie Munster from EFM, who provide businesses with financial expertise on a flexible, cost-effective outsource basis, essentially a virtual FD or finance director service. Both will be sharing their experiences of working with growing companies, as well as valuable tips for staying finance fit. First and foremost, it's time for us to perhaps find out uh, what my colleagues have been up to. I'm very pleased, as ever, to be joined by my colleagues, Claire McAnulty and Trevor Meriden. Evening all, how are you? Evening, very good. Very, very good. Um, so um, what I was very struck by in the news was some, some rather odd noises um, coming from the Bank of England this week, normally given to very sort of bland pronouncements on ac- economics. The, uh, the bank's chief economist, Andrew Haldane, raised um, ageing eyebrows with his remarks at a speech to local business leaders in Kenilworth, where he described the UK's economy as writhing in both agony and ecstasy. Um, never has an economy sounded more <laughs> intriguing. It sounds, it sounds like something out of Fifty Shades, really. I mean, but uh, his duller message, though, was that interest rates should remain low to avoid long-term economic stagnation because of weaker global growth, low wage growth, and you know all the things you've, you've heard about on the on the news. But he said there were still plenty of reasons to be cheerful. Growth is set to be the fastest of any major economy this year, and inflation and borrowing costs are low. However, he said the reasons to uh, be fearful included productivity and wages, which had not risen. Uh, at all well a little bit but not not much um so we should really ask our listeners uh, what are you writhing in agony <laughs> or ecstasy um our studio number of, as always is 01727839 or twitter at rv the business i mean how are you feeling about it um, these days claire yeah i mean I, I do like the idea of the economy sounding intriguing <laughs> that's very good and um, well as we're talking about businesses staying financially fit I thought I'd mention a related problem that small businesses have, myself included, which is managing your time efficiently. Because as the saying goes, time is money and the two are actually very linked. The advantages that we businesses have in 2014 are the number of apps and software programmes, often free, that help us. Most of us use the regular ones, Skype, Dropbox, Evernote. So I'm going to share with you a programme I started using a couple of months ago. It's helped me, so hopefully it's one that can help other small business owners too. It's called Clock. It's actually spelled K-L-O-K. The basic version is free. Without going into exactly how it works, it allows you to time each task you do for each client. And you can also connect the system to your invoicing system and that's the technical bit what you do find out very quickly though is that the saying time goes quickly when you're enjoying yourself is it very very true because it's easy to spend more time on enjoyable tasks and think that they're only taking 20 minutes when it's actually been an hour and conversely feel that you've been going at a a particularly arduous or tricky task for 40 minutes and then look over and find out it's it's actually only been 12. So the programme really works as a regulator. I suppose it's like having a virtual boss, even though that boss is actually you. Um, So, I mean, what do you both think? Do you think you can possibly be successful in business without being good at time management? Or do you think it's almost as vital as managing your finance as well? I think it is vital. And what I love about that particular app, as you say, is that it also triggers invoices. Because I think one of the biggest issues is cash flow. As we've discussed before, 
before. And as a small business, one of the things you often suffer from is this lack of ability to get your invoicing done on time and then to make sure that they're paid. So I think uh, a combination of the two, my, critical. My wise father-in-law, um, <laughs> who sort of ran a hotel business for sort of many years, said you should devote 10% of your time to those particular tasks. And he broke it down, everything that he said, you know, this amount of percentage on new business, this amount on, on your clients and, you know, and, and so on. But he had everything sort of divided divided up and he got but I think I think time management is absolutely essential not because it's especially exciting of itself but it's just simply that it is provides you with the sort of bedrock of from which you can actually go and and do creative inventive profitable profitable things when you've worked in a large company which most of us have before we've, been, we've opened our own businesses you're used to somebody else standing over you and determining your time and then what you find is when you start being in control of your own time, sometimes you're, you're not very good at it because mm. you've actually not had much, you're not in much practice at it. You've usually had somebody. So this is another reason why I quite like this programme. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Roma, what, 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 have you, what have you got? Well, obviously, we're all focusing on this idea of finance, staying finance fit. And you know how I f- often I like to go and find something a bit weird and quirky? Well, I've, um, I've heard, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard. <laughs> I found um, quite an interesting little story in The Guardian. They'd done a quick survey of companies to look at um, businesses that might have come up with quirky ways of funding themselves, Um, looking at starting up from crowdfunding, venture capital, borrowing from the bank or maybe family. They're the probably more traditional ways that we're aware of. But there are many other tried and tested routes to finance um, your business. And um, especially if you don't want to um, end up with uh, giving up equity or getting into debt. So they went and hunted out a few entrepreneurs who we all know are usually quite inventive and looked for stories that were a bit unusual and quirky and here's what they found out three quirky ways to fund your business number one share a bedroom with a business partner (laughs) (laughs) Um, I came across quite a, a hilarious story actually two young entrepreneurs who both have their own businesses but felt the need to be in London to launch their businesses successfully but just couldn't afford to do it on their own so to cut the cost they shared accommodation and that accommodation not only gave them somewhere to sleep at night but somewhere to work and also share the burden of the costs Mm. as well as support each other in starting their businesses so that was number one sell stuff on ebay One young lady decided she didn't want to use her redundancy money to set up her PR and marketing services business. So she raised startup capital by eBaying all sorts and then on top of that going to Kickstarter for crowdfunding. So that was a nice little combination. And actually, if I think about the amount of stuff I've got, I could probably start two businesses. Um, The third one was becoming a weekend market trader. Now, this isn't the first time I've heard this, this particular one. You can with some markets get yourself a, a temporary pitch um, and so what this uh, this lady did was um, she was a children's book author who had decided that she would sell bric-a-brac at a stall in the local Sunday market to raise money to cover her publishing costs and then of course she told everyone her story this is why I'm doing it everyone was keen to hear um, see her book so she successfully launched her book on that stall and mm. the rest was history mm. quirky ideas but they work right we like quirky ideas on uh, <laughs> on this show right well we'll be back with the um uh, the the main theme of this show and um, right after these announcements apples apples and more apples a tale at nurseries on saturday the 18th and sunday the 19th of october at our apple weekend from bramley's to christmas per main there are 14 varieties to sample and buy all undercover for the autumn weather jam and chutney tasting pedal powered smoothies find out about beekeeping there's something for all the family a tale at nursery's apple weekend saturday and sunday the 18th and 19th just off the north orbital road st albans radio verulam community partners the abbey line connects st albans abbey train station at the bottom of hollywell hill with watford junction and was one of the uk's first official community railways the community rail concept was designed to help create a more sustainable future, to reduce the cost of running the line without compromising safety or service, and to involve local people more closely in the development of their railway. For 150 years, the Abbey Line has been taking people between St Albans and the centre of Watford and beyond. It continues to do this, and all for at most £6.60 return, and in only 16 minutes. For more information, visit their website 
which is abbeyline.org.uk. For more on Radio Verulam Community Partners, go to radioverulam.com slash community partners. You're listening to The Business on Radio Verulam. We're the voice of the local business community on 92.6 FM and on radioverulam.com. Welcome back. Tonight we're talking about keeping your business financially fit. As we heard at the top of the show, having a great business idea, it's all well and good, but if you don't have financial security, you don't actually have a business. So what are the options when you first decide to take that great idea to market? Well, we're going to explore some tips for staying healthy as you grow and also looking at how to ensure your business is never underfunded. We'll have contributions from Professor Nigel Culkin, Vicky Humber, Daniel Moss and the Trestle Theatre. But we're going to start by introducing you to our studio guest tonight and we have with us Sylvia of the TLO from our sponsors, Kingston Smith and Ronnie Munster from EFM. Perhaps you could both start by telling me a little bit about your own businesses. Can I start with you, Sylvia? Well, thank you. Good evening. Um, Yes, our business, Kingston Smith, is based in uh, St Albans. We're um, a top 20 firm of accountants. We work with all sorts of entrepreneurs, um, all sorts of businesses across all sorts of sectors. Um, It makes it a very exciting mix, I have to say, because you meet all sorts of people doing all sorts of things and come across a range of issues and problems for them. Um, um, It's a really good opportunity this evening to talk about that financial side, which is something that is absolutely key. You, You sort of hit the nail on the head, really, when you said it's great to have a great idea, but it isn't a business until you can actually make it make money and sustain itself and and Ronnie can you just tell us a little bit about your business In, indeed yes um, EFM actually was established probably about 12 years ago and although its head office is in Luton we actually are all over the country where we provide really virtual FDs if you like um, we are an outsource service and we work mainly with businesses in the SME sector so that's everything really from start up to businesses with, say, £25 million turnover. And a lot of these businesses are excellent businesses run by entrepreneurs with excellent ideas. But what they struggle with sometimes, sometimes they realise it and sometimes they don't, they struggle with the fact that behind their idea you need to have an infrastructure, and that might be cash flow management or debtor control or due diligence or reporting, whatever it is. And they can't afford a full-time finance director. So we work on an outsource kind of pay-as-you-go basis. So some of my colleagues work one day a week at a client or two days a week, or I've done projects which are a few days or a few weeks. It's a complete mix. But what we offer the business community is the opportunity to use skilled and qualified, experienced finance directors um, on whatever basis suits the business. And, and, and are, you, is it, are you speaking with them or you, you're helping them with, with their, their systems? Or? It's everything. You know, mm. I will, uh, for example, there's a, there's a business where I was at last year where um, they decided to f- sack the finance team. Um, and so I was called in and I brought a couple of colleagues in and suddenly I was sitting there rolling up my sleeves and doing the VAT returns and the payroll. <laughs> But there's another business where they're planning a strategy and we sit there and we help them work out what their strategy is. So it's everything. It's, and we act often as an interface between people like Sylvia's business and also the bankers to help the businesses and the businessmen, business owners develop what their business is. Um, and therefore, we think we provide a, an excellent service. No, you, the two of you sound absolutely qualified to, to speak about what we're going to talk, talk about tonight. So what we're going to start with is the businesses starting up and... Um, can you, can you tell me, Sylvia, what are some of the typical ways that small businesses fund their start-up? Okay, there's a range of, of ways in which a small business will look to, to fund. Um, from the very simple family, friends uh, and fools, as we <laughs> call it, there'll be people that will invest in the business because they believe in the individual. Um, if you go outside of that area where it's a business that really needs some more significant funding, then we always find that those that successfully 
uh, pitch to a bank or to other investors will have a business plan. It's absolutely crucial. If you can't articulate in a document what it is that you want, how you, you're going to use it, what the payback is going to be, and how you're going to invest in it, then you're not really going to be able to in, introduce an, anybody else to your business successfully. So we do work very much with businesses, um, particularly startups, explaining to them why it's really important to to really set out in a very simple, straightforward, I'm not talking about a great big tome of a, a book, but something about your business, what it's about, how it's going to achieve. Um, being able to articulate your recognition of the strengths and the weaknesses of your business and the threats and the opportunities. I'm afraid none of it is rocket science. It does come back to a very straightforward way. Um, and th the most um, opportunities that, that, that people are finding are... It, once they have that document, they're able to go out and speak to uh, banks, to crowdfunders, whoever. But it is quite critical that they, they do, do that. Do you find similar, Ronnie? Yes, we do. And it's interesting what Sylvia just said, because once you start to put those details down in a spreadsheet, not that the spreadsheet is necessarily our favourite tool, it does help you articulate those ideas mm. and bring to mind, well, what are you selling and what do you have to buy to make this product and how are you able to get this out into the market? Because having an idea, anybody can sit down and have an idea, would you, but articulating it... But would you would you recommend though that um, you know you talked about it doesn't have to be a tome, Sylvia? Mm. But I mean, would you recommend actually people try and distill down and distill down just to get to the essence of what they're Absolutely. selling? Absolutely, I think there's some very basic steps that you need to go through to to ensure that you cover all of the bases. But I think when you talk about a strategic plan, sometimes or a business plan, uh, the concept is that it's a very big document. Mm. It's very um, heavy to get through. It, that isn't the the point of it. I think what you need is to be able to put down very clearly and succinctly what your idea is so if it's a product or a service or, or whatever it is what that's going to be like who you're going to use how much money you're going to need when it's going to come in the actual act of doing that and I absolutely agree the act of doing that makes you start to think about the bits that you didn't think about mm. and those are the most successful businesses and what we'll be exploring tonight are some some slightly um, different ways of, of raising funds and um, I wondered before we go into our first clip which is about raising funds through things like competitions I mean what about raising funds through entering a competition and winning money to start a business is that something you've heard much about N not me personally. I mean, I'm more familiar with the slightly more traditional routes. But having said that, Kickstarter and crowdfunding is increasingly important. And although it's one step from that, once you've started a business, there are a number of financing opportunities. There's invoice financing. Um, and there are some newer businesses on the block which allow businesses to do single invoice finance. So once you've got a business up and running, you can use this rather than the traditional bank's approach to invoice finance. There are companies, some of whom we've met, who provide um, on a single invoice basis the ability to raise funds and, and that helps companies get going as well. So there are various ways in which you can do it. So we, we're going to turn our attention briefly to fledging businesses and, and funding through competitions and our very own Roma Bomek recently played Dragon Judge at a business <laughs> competition <laughs> called Flair. Flair is the University of Hertfordshire's annual competition to help students and alumni launch new businesses or come up with innovative ideas. It offers budding entrepreneurs support and training in areas such as writing a business proposal and prize funding to help bring ideas to life. There's also help and support via expert industry coaches and mentors. At the awards dinner, Roma bumped into Professor Nigel Culkin, president of the Institute for Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Roma began by asking him if he thought competitions were useful in terms of access to funding. I do. I think that some people, some companies can get hooked on them and they become competition junkies. But I think what they do is they help, to re they help you to refine your message. And once you've got your message, then you can go out and use these uh, to get funding, big funding. And um, Nigel, I know that you're very heavily involved and have been advising government on, um, or part of a steering group advising government on high growth, um, small and medium sized businesses. What would you say are some of the key points about financial robustness? Well, what I 
find most exciting at the moment is that we are finally seeing other forms and recognising other forms of finance providers than just the banks. The banks have always had a place, uh, but in the UK, you know, banks provide something like 90% of all loans. Uh, when the states, it's something like 50%, 60%. And um, I think the important point is to is for companies to accept that at some point they're likely to need finance. Go to the place where you're not only going to get the finance, but you're going to get the support that goes with it. Okay, and so in terms of businesses wanting not just to start up, but build on the success they've already had, are there, are there any key tips you would give um, in terms of not just stability, but sustainability? I think that one of the, the big tips is to, is to make sure that you always have time or always make time in your diary to think about the business not just being in the business and and getting the next piece of work but thinking about how you want the business to be in not in five years time it, it, but actually what what shape it wants to be and so you know you're all, you should always be looking for okay if I get this piece of business what are the type of people I need what are the skills I need and start working on trying to attract those skills early or have them in place so when the opportunity comes you get the piece of business you've warmed up that resource to pull them in so you can deliver that business and that's for me that's one of the big successes of small firms growing and that was Professor Nigel Culkin talking with Roma at the Flair competition. Now, a couple of comments there. One, one of the things was the, the business about the banks. He mentions the fact that in the UK, about 90% of people will get loans from the bank for the business, as opposed to 50%, 60% in the US. Um, I mean, do you find still people going to the bank for loans? Do you think people have kind of stopped doing that quite as much as they used to? I think we tend to find actually people go elsewhere now. They tend to go either to friends and family or fools, as <laughs> Sylvia quite rightly said. But there's a lot of, I suppose, professional investors or wealthy entrepreneurs who are very keen to support businesses. One of my clients, they have a um, whole range of businesses that they raise funds for, and these all come from other businessmen that uh, they manage to, I don't know if persuade is the best term, but what they do, they involve these businesses in the product and they raise funds that way. So certainly in terms of my specific clients, the, the bank is not actually used at all. What about you, Sylvia? What do you find? I think we're still seeing the bank being used quite a lot, but not exclusively, and I think that's the, the probable change. So the bank is always there in the background uh, for some of the lending, um, and particularly where there's a strong business uh, proposal, the bank is very keen, as you can imagine, to be involved. But we are seeing a lot more... Um, alternatives coming in uh, to that, which I think is very healthy for a business rather than being just dependent upon one source. And and as the professor mentioned, he, he said, you know, go to, go to somewhere where you where you will get both finance and support and and business support because you you quite often need both. Um, I mean, again, Sylvia, do you you provide that with them um, with Kingston Smith? Are you are you quite big on the, the support side of it's things? It's absolutely crucial, um, and it's part of our business advisory part. And I, I think there's a lot of businesses doing that all in different ways. Um, it's about developing not just the individuals within the business, but how they're going to take that business forward. So a lot of it is to do with succession. And uh, over the last few months or so, that's um, been a big part of what I've been looking at. But helping people developing the business, uh, spot new opportunities, try to avoid some threats, maybe st stripping out something that they don't need out in their business or seeing opportunities. So a lot of that comes along with the finance part of it too. So yes, mentoring people, um, facilitating their discussions um, as to what they want for their next stage is absolutely critical. And one of the things that did get mentioned um, was Kickstarter, so we're going to look at the, that type of funding for, for startups. Um, now this form of crowdfunding has been a very popular way for anyone with a great idea but limited funds mm -hmm. to go to market. It's become more popular over the last couple of years. And recently Roma came across Vicky Humber of Humber's Homemade Preserves 
who tapped into Kickstarter to develop her business. Roma started by asking Vicky to tell her a little bit about how she started. I started out making at home and then last July using some crowdfunding I was able to go into a little unit and it's absolute heaven. With four kids at home it's so much nice to go to work and come back but it's also good to shut the door and leave work there rather than you know in the whole holidays the children go can I have some toast? No you're not allowed toast. Fantastic so you're quite a new business still and I'm interested in the concept of um, accessing crowdfunding. How did that come about? Basically, we're, this is our seventh year. I started because I had um, a nervous breakdown and I found making jam really therapeutic. But the crowdfunding, basically I'd come across this little unit that would have been would be ideal for me. It just was perfect. It was a 10 out of 10, but I just couldn't afford to do it. Um, so I just put on Facebook and Twitter, which I do quite a lot with the business. And, um, and the friend said, oh, you know, I said, has anyone got a money tree? And then a friend put on, he says, well, have you ever thought of crowdfunding? And his sister had funded a book um, by using Kickstarter. So, um, so yeah, so we, we went through Kickstarter. We raised just over £2,000. So using the social media as well to promote the crowdfunding. So, but without those backers, I wouldn't have been able to, to move into the unit. And that was Vicky Humber from Humber's Homemade Preserves, giving us some insights there as to why she chose the Kickstarter for funding. And um, have you had any experience of Kickstarter, uh, Ronnie? Yes, I do. I, I've actually got some personal experience. My daughter wanted to make a film. Uh, we're talking about um, a 20 minute drama to enter into film festivals. So this is a proper film. And by dint of much persuasion, she set up a Kickstarter account and raised approximately seven and a half thousand pounds to make a short film Um, and with that money she was able to set up the production process which involved a lot of begging and borrowing no stealing but um, (laughs) it was a a very stressful period as you can imagine but I saw Kickstarter and crowdfunding in action because we'd looked at a number of different crowdfunding opportunities and I was very impressed with how people are able to raise funds for a huge variety of projects and it does work it Mm. really does work and a lot of people who invest in the film is a classic example they're not looking for a return they just want to contribute I think as well, particularly with something creative, creative does very well in Kickstarter, doesn't it? And also things like new inventions do yes. very well. Those are the, the two things. But what about you, Sylvia? Have you any uh, thoughts absolutely. on Absolutely. I think crowdfunding loves that um, in all of its senses. It likes um, new technology. It likes a new product. Um, as you say, something that's artistic. Uh, it does lend itself to that because it's about capturing the imagination um, and saying that unless you actually help, this isn't going to get off the ground. So I think if you can paint a picture of something that's brand new, new something that's just breaking the new ground um crowdfunding really does lie with that it does support i have to say more traditional businesses as well but the ones that you see with those sort of surprising results do tend to have that element to them can i can i just ask about the you, you were talking ronnie about the profit motive there yeah. i mean it's a, is is the profit for people who invest in in crowdfunding it's a nice to have then is that is that what we're you're both i think sort so, of yes. saying so it's yes. not the main thing no it's, it's, certainly i mean in terms of the one i, I was indirectly involved in Um, it was just to for the investors because that's what they are even if they put £10 in it's so that they could just say I contributed and they put their name on the film at the end of the film everybody you contributed is there as as one of the contributors you know and if the film is successful for example then they can say I helped that film get an Oscar. And so to that extent, I suppose it's unlocking a whole new sort of motive around it's a funding. Di- it's new, a completely yeah. different way of looking at yeah. things, very different from the traditional banks and the VCs. And I, I, I was certainly very impressed by that. Yeah. And, and it also, I think, works on the idea of if you get a lot of people just to put in a, a small amount, you've, you've suddenly got, you know, you've got your funding, you've got what you need. Exactly, yes. Okay. And a lot of people were just £10 and £20. And there were some unbelievably generous donations from people that we'd never heard of. <laughs> no, it, was, it was a considerably um, uplifting experience, really. And, and did, it, did it do well? Did the film get made? And the film was made. Um, there will be a screening of the film at some point uh, later this year, and it's being entered into film festivals as we speak. So Fantastic. next year I may or may not have a famous child in my house. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> 
Well, we're discussing staying financially fit tonight with our studio guests, Sylvia Vitiello and Ronnie Munster. When we come back, we'll look at keeping your finances stable and also at what to do if your expected income suddenly takes a nosedive. Radio Verulam Community Partners. Founded in 1845, the St Albans and Hertfordshire Architectural and Archaeological Society is one of the oldest historical societies in the country. Our key objective is to promote interest in the architecture, archaeology and history of St Albans in particular, and Hertfordshire in general. The core focus of the Society's activity is our lecture programme. We organise 28 lectures a year, attracting speakers of national and international importance, as well as those of more local interest. Research groups shining light on life in the area in the 17th century and the First World War are particularly active. To facilitate their research, all members have access to our extensive library, currently based in the Town Hall. For further information, please see the Society's website, stalbanshistory.org. For more on Radio Verulam Community Partners, go to radioverulam.com slash community partners. Mum wanted me to take chlorine tablets on my travels. There's no need, I told her. I have my fantastic water-to-go filter bottle that eliminates over 99.9% of all microbiological contaminants. I pointed her to the website, watertogo.eu, so she could see for herself. Safe, clean water, wherever I go. Thanks to Water2Go. The Business, sponsored by Kingston Smith Chartered Accountants. At Kingston Smith, our ethos is simple. We want our clients to succeed. Welcoming owner-managed businesses and individuals, we pride ourselves on offering the local business community a range of services that best supports their needs for maximum growth. Kingston Smith, helping our clients succeed. Find us on St. Peter Street in the heart of St. Albans. Or for more information, head to kingstonsmith.co.uk. And welcome back. You're listening to The Business and it's uh, just coming up to 8.33. Our show this evening is all about finance from startup to growing businesses. So, so far, we've looked at some ideas to get your your idea, your business idea off the ground. But what about keeping your business fit and healthy and ensuring you have the foundations you need to build on success? Particularly if you're going to be um, trying to push your business forward quite rapidly. And we're pleased to still have Sylvia Vitiello from Kingston Smith and Ronnie Munster from EFM, who've kindly agreed to stay with us for the second half, to uh, talk through some of the key issues that you might face as an established business. Sylvia, um, what about the business owner who's moved beyond that first two-year stage and is beginning to see some stability and growth? What are some of the key issues for them in the context of staying finance fit? Okay, growing um, your business is a whole new set of issues for you to to deal with. The, the start-up, as we talked about with the initial business plan, but of course by the time you're going into the growth phase, that's a really important part for you to look at. The step-up may mean that you actually have to give up some of the control that you really originally started your business for, and that can be one of the hardest parts for an entrepreneur. And by that I mean that if you've got people, um, somebody who's very good at doing what they were doing, they've been successful at that early phase, at some point they're going to need some help, whether it's with finances, admin, marketing, whatever it is, even innovation. Um, And that can sometimes be a really difficult step for people to take. Um, It's about self-analysis, understanding where the inhibitors are coming for your business and being brave enough to actually start to step away and to take that slightly more um, helicopter view if you like of your business and bring in the people who can do the things that you're not absolutely brilliant at it's that good old combined issue isn't it of a letting go as you say Mm -hmm. but be beginning to work on the business not always in the business yes if you can stop sometimes put your head up look and see which direction you're going in then you're going to be more likely to get that um, success from your business and that's a really hard point and it shouldn't really be underestimated by any entrepreneur the reason they went into business probably was because they liked doing the things that they were doing and they've done it very well for the first two years to take it up to the next step means actually approaching it slightly differently Ronnie, what's your experience i, I think that sums it up perfectly um, there's a 
There's an excellent book, which I think we're all familiar with around the table, which is by uh, Michael E. Gerber, and it's called The E-Myth, or The E-Myth Revisited is the latest version. And that describes exactly what Sylvia just said, because the entrepreneur starts with the idea and they're very enthusiastic about it, whatever it is, whether it's furniture making or sandwich making or cakes, as it is in this particular book. And it's standing back at that point and realising that you need somebody to do the bookkeeping, somebody to sweep the floors, perhaps somebody to do your HR and your marketing. And these days, there are also a lot of tools to help you, apps like Clock, um, and there's a lot of cloud-based software that you can use for your customer relationship management, CRM systems. And it's being able to step back and realise that to make your business work, you do what you're good at and get other people to support you so you can take your business to that next stage. And that really is a critical lesson. And if I had one recommendation, it's look up the e-myth on, on Amazon or one of those websites and read it. It's not a very long book. It's got a nice large font. And it really, tell, really tells you everything you need to know to develop. Okay. I mean, uh, b books like The E-Myth are undoubtedly really valuable. And as you say, all these things need to be tackled, need to be looked at head on. But how do you then make sure that, you know, as we've, as we've talked about so far in the show, staying finance fit at this stage where essentially all these things cost extra money, how do you make sure that you keep that balance of moving forward, bringing in the right people, bringing in the right technology, if that's what you have to do, but at the same time maintaining that financial stability. I think one of the things that Sylvia and I um, met just before the programme started, and one of the things we were talking about is that entrepreneurs often confuse profit with cash flow. And I think any business owner, what they need to do is stop and think about what it is they're achieving. Because if they're very profitable, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. What you need is, what we all know is, what you need is cash in the bank. And you actually need to understand what it is the numbers are telling you. You might be issuing invoices, but you might not be collecting the cash. You might not even be issuing invoices, as some of our mutual clients do, which is unbelievable. But people do work, and then they don't send an invoice. Or if they send an invoice, they don't trust. So it's understanding all these things that perhaps are meat and drink to people like Sylvia and myself. But actually, for many business people, they're thinking about their product and how to sell it and market it and the websites and so on. And actually, it's getting a grip on these basic things. Mm. And then they can keep an eye on being financially fit. Then they'll understand what it is to be fit. Well, uh, oh, sorry. So sorry, you were about to say, it's Sylvia. Absolutely. That's the point. And sometimes it's realising that your enthusiasm and your energy for your, your product or your service or whatever, your business generally, actually is the thing that's going to inhibit you going forward. And having the, the business owner or owners step away from that financial part of it and do the credit control by somebody who actually knows how to do it. I'm not sure anybody actually enjoys it. There must be some <laughs> that really enjoy credit control. Or getting the invoicing out or controlling the work in progress and whatever it is. Um, those are the, the things where it's absolutely critical and it's having an action plan. Yes, it will cost money to bring somebody in and you're right, but if you can actually forecast that out and see where that cost is and where the, the benefit of bringing the cash in quicker or controlling the cost, perhaps having a proper purchaser who will get you the best deals, whatever it is, will actually pay for itself and allow you to be released to go on further. So, yes, it, it is difficult. There's actually uh, this point of of sort of being able to afford um, the right kind of credit control support. Uh, one of the things I did for some time was work in the area of business support. Mm -hmm. And what we started to do was um, get companies to pair with each other and, and share resources and again you might find that there's a non-competing organisation in your locality another small business perhaps just a bit bigger than you that do have that kind of backup that might not mind sharing their resource in the context of credit control mm. Trevor? Yeah I mean and on that subject about sort of you know having sort of buddying up with a, with, a, with another business I'd be interested to know from both of you I mean we're really talking about three types of people those those that are um, who get what you're saying and are able to adapt um, those who are effectively the bottle stoppers on their own sort of growth <laughs> you know, and, and, but, but what about that bunch in the middle those who could be coached or mentored or cajoled into a different way of looking things I mean how, what's the breakdown in your experience roughly I'm, I'm not sure I've got an analysis of the breakdown, but I yeah. think it's where people like myself or our firm EFM and Kingston Smith as well 
people like us, we're able to sit down with these entrepreneurs and provide them the guidance they need. And that's mm-hmm. that's the beauty of the services. There are there are lots of businesses that provide support. Mm-hmm. And if you can hold their hand and walk them through, I don't know, a budget, a cash flow model, a forecast, or where to find a cheap bookkeeper, or how to do marketing, credit yeah. control, all these yeah. things, yeah. you can help these people in between hopefully move in the direction that you want them to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, while we're on the subject, we, you both keep mentioning the services that your organisations provide, and we will at the end ask you to repeat. But maybe this is a good opportunity briefly to tell um, our listeners how they might get hold of you if they want to find out more. Sylvia? Sure. Um, well, we're based in St Albans. We have uh, six offices, though, all around the M25 and in London. But our office, obviously, is in St Albans, St Peter's Street. But if you go onto our website, you'll be able to see details of us, and it's www www.kingstonsmith.co.uk um, and I'm sure that you, you will be able to sort of focus down into the St Albans office and unfortunately find a picture of me there as well <laughs> as um, but no, uh, it's, it's something that we find people are coming through our website more and more because we've uh, got bits and pieces on there which I think highlight us and, and what we're doing with business advisory Excellent, and Ronnie? It's a similar story. We are, in a sense, we're virtual, although we have an office staffed with some people. Um, because we're all over the country, um, people access us through, our, through the website, type EFM into Google, and it comes up. And on the website as well, there's what we call a toolkit. So people who are in businesses where they might be struggling, they can use some of the tools to analyse um, and get reports whether they think they're underperforming in a particular area. For example, there's a VAT health check and a cash health check. And these are useful tools for people to determine whether they are in need of support, and usually they are. Excellent. So already lots of ideas there. Well, let's um, hear what another business owner had to say. Again at the Flair Awards, I met a, a young man, Daniel Moss, who's founder and managing director of Broomfield Youth, a social enterprise um, who had benefited from the Flair Awards previously, and he's gro- his business is growing very quickly. Let's hear what he had to say. We're a youth football club and recognised as one of the... Uh largest the most successful in the country how long have you been going we're going into our third season excellent and can you tell me we've just been having a quick chat about funding and finance one of the things you've just pointed out to me is how quickly your business has grown but also you're now beginning to not just sustain yourself but push that growth even further how have you managed to do that and we decided to create a new template we decided to introduce a standing order payment for our parents so it's quick and easy for them and it allows us to project cash flow and also um, allows us to you know, invest money into new projects and diversify. And for us it's been the, the most um, successful and you know, new cultural thing to do as a, as a company. So would you say that became key quite quickly for you or was it something you realised over time? No, definitely. Once we introduced it, we realised that, you know, for us, um, you know, saving time is key. And I think in any new business, um, if you spend a lot of time chasing payments and chasing invoices, um, you know, you're going to be spending a lot of time on that rather than growing the business and looking at other areas of expansion. So, you know, personally, we decided this was a a key contributor towards a business growth. and, um, And we're really pleased that we introduced that early on. Well, that was Daniel Moss from Broomfield Youth. And as I say, Daniel advocated uh, a system which ensures that he's got a regular base income. And in his case, it's encouraging direct debits. Ronnie, what are your thoughts on uh, having a system in place like that? Oh, well, you're talking to the right person. I love (laughs) systems. I I think in another life, I must have been a programmer or something. (laughs) But I think systems are very important. Process is a very important part of establishing a successful business. And, you know, it starts at the beginning from the sales process all the way through. But as as your clip showed, the the man decided to um, put in place standing orders, which is excellent. That's the first stage. But then I... When I heard it, I was thinking, obviously, the next stage is, well, how are you recording that? It's all very well collecting it, but are you monitoring it? Um, And one of the things I've noticed in the past two years is that there's an increasing amount of cloud-based bookkeeping and business-oriented accounting software. So you can load these things in directly. There's a couple that I've used. One is called Zero with an X, and the other one is called Cashflow with a K. Why can't they spell these things properly? (laughs) Um, But you can literally download everything off the bank 
into the system and it tells and they're very they're quite intelligent reasonably intelligent i mean it is software um and it tells you what's been uploaded and then you can quickly identify it and if you set it up and it's not difficult to set up because it's aimed at business people it's not aimed at accountants you can keep track of oh these people have paid but actually these are still missing and it gives you graphs and so on they're not comprising ledgers and all the sort of things that we, mm. Sylvia and I, probably grew up loving. <laughs> yeah. um, I, th- but I, think, I think as well, a lot of these things are free, aren't they? A lot of a lot of the software now is yeah, free. Yeah, free-ish. Or, or, yeah, or or, you, or small amounts. Yeah. A lot a lot of the apps for your for your phone Absolutely. things are free that keep track of invoicing. Yeah, and you can, the other advantage is obviously perhaps not for this football coach, but for other businesses, you can operate them from your mobile phone. So you can be with a client and you can say, right, that's all agreed. And you can issue him or her an invoice there and then. And uh, we, we've we got a, a client who does that, and that's that's fantastic. He's in the premises, right, issue the invoice, and it goes into the system. Perfect. I think um, system, you're, you're leaning on an open door when you talk about systems, I think, with us too. Um, the true, truly valuable businesses have systems embedded within them right from the start and they grow with them and they, they, they support the system. And I always use a rather um, unusual example. I talk about McDonald's with my clients because it's a, a multi-million pound business that's run by teenagers because they've systemised everything. Now, I'm not saying that everybody can actually systemise to that point, but actually the more systems, the more regular regulations, the more internal controls sorry I'm sounding like an auditor now but (laughs) the more that those that you can put internally the less that you have to do and that means it frees up the business owner's time to look at the business understand what's going on so yeah using software using the systems putting the controls in de-skilling absolutely as much as you can right from day one is is really the thing to aim for but it's the thing that will really pay off when you come to your time for growth do you do you think many people going through the growing stage of their business Mm -hmm. actually see systems and all that sort of stuff that they may think is dull stuff you know um as a as as wasting time or taking away from their creativity they don't actually see it as a platform one for the other no they uh very often people will not see the the value in it until you get them to do the first bit Mm. and then they see the value in it and then they realize actually you know what i could do Mm. i could do it with this and i could do it with that so um i think it's about painting the picture making people understand what technology they need to use now um and what controls as well because i think that comes back to what we were saying before making sure not just the systems but the internal controls to make sure you chase up your debtors etc yeah i mean um what's interesting and and we will definitely bring daniel and in fact vicky we haven't had them on as studio guests yet but daniel has been able to build or upscale his business very quickly because he recognized very early on that initial funding is great but he needs to get the cash flow in to have a base to build on and i think uh, you know i'm sure we could go on about that and we will do in, in a future show so let's move on to our next and final clip um so again under the theme of staying financially fit it can prove challenging when what you had as guaranteed income suddenly dries up the trestle theater in st albans already was already working hard to make ends meet when they were faced with the knowledge that they would have their arts council funding cut in 2011 Claire McAnulty spoke to Emily Gray, Artistic Director of the Trestle, and Denise Parsons, a Duty Manager. She started by asking Emily how they prepared themselves for the drop in revenues. The major thing was just kind of knowing that we were going to have to change. That was the first thing, really, of kind of admitting that um, about four, more than 40% of our income was going to be going. Um, and we had a year to prepare for this, this change. We really had to kind of get look at the core of our company, work out what we do wanted to continue doing and what we needed to, to shift. There were big changes in staffing. We had to reduce our staff down um, a lot, but we wanted to keep the building open, to keep our workshops going, keep our mass business going. Um, so then it became about... Um, being incredibly efficient with how we did everything um, and looking at new ways of developing revenue streams and um, and also very much opening out to the local community and saying, please help us. If you want Trestle Arts Space to continue, we need people's help. And at, kind of at that point in the story, um, our wonderful yes. <laughs> volunteers turned up, one in the shape of Denise. Yes, I, I got a job here sort of part-time um, as a duty manager and just immediately got heavily involved in the day-to-day kind of you know me being me and nosy and wanting to know everything uh which then kind of led on to uh us thinking about putting on a live music night which is what i ended up developing 
again, this kind of idea of diversifying and using what we've got to get people into the building. Um, so we're not only providing a great sort of arts-based night of live music, but we are um, getting people into the building, which hopefully has a knock-on effect to everything else that we've got here to offer. And actually, it, it has worked, I would say. The music night is free, but obviously you're hoping that, that people now being aware of where the trestle is and possibly some of the things that are going on at the trestle, then yeah. what, what starts off as a free night actually can, can earn you income. So do you want to just tell me a little bit about that? Yes. I mean, as soon as people walk in the building, they are always impressed by the actual building itself and generally don't know what else we've got to offer so obviously I do make a big effort to let everyone know what else we've got to offer here and it does work we've ha I've had a lot of people that have come along to my nights have then gone on to hire for private parties or for business groups or just come along to shows and just generally more aware of what what's going on and it's also worth pointing out that of course we do bring in income through the bar on the mute live music yes, nights, yes, that's a significant yes. help to us to yeah. keep to keep going. Absolutely. So you know we don't need to charge people on the door mm. um, because we we are you know covering our costs and more with their generous drinking habits. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with music, yeah. And uh, tell me a little bit, Emily, about the different ways that you bring money into the trestle. When we have to, have to pay professional performers to come here, we have to do that in partnership with the company that's bringing their work here. Um, and generally, we try together to get audiences. I think gone are the days where you could just say, oh, we'll pay a company this amount to come and perform. And then, you know, if we get a bit of box office, great. But if we don't, you know, when we were funded, it was much more possible to do that. Now we have no funding. We have to make sure that our costs are covered and that that company's costs are covered. But it becomes a different kind of a conversation. So we're saying to companies that we generally that we know that we might have already worked in partnership we will say to them well how can we help can we be at the beginning of your tour so maybe we don't pay you quite the fee that you'll be expecting later on in your tour but come and use our facilities use this wonderful technical space to get your production up and running and then we'll we'll share the ticket sales with you maybe it'll be 50 50 we'll cover our costs you will just about cover costs and then you can go off on a tour and get much bigger box office splits from other places so all the time it's about negotiating and and working out what like as Denise says what we can give to people here at this lovely venue and what they can give to us and how it's going to help both parties you make masks here don't you you also rent out the rooms do you want to just tell me a little bit about those routes for mm. for revenue Yes, in terms of different revenue streams, um, hiring out to the art space is, is a crucial part of that. And that's for community groups, it's for events and parties, um, for businesses as well. Um, and that's, we've got beautiful spaces here, so that, that works. And in the last couple of years, we've really pushed those spaces to be, you know, every space to be as full as possible. Um, and we have very differing rates depending on, you know, what, what users can afford. And then we also make masks, and these masks are all made here, they're handcrafted, and then they're sold across the world. Um, and with really pushing on social media, actually, that's, that's changed, and um, free Google advertising for charities <laughs> that we've taken advantage of. Um, our mask sales are increasing or have increased over the last couple of years, so that's been really helpful. And then we also do a lot of educational projects, so working in the local schools and, and schools across the country, and working with FE and HE, and with adults. Yeah, there's a whole range of educational work that we do and participatory work so that's also an income stream so a good reaction to a bad situation there um the trestle trestle theater extremely creative you had free nights creative ideas really engaging the community to help them drive some revenue through the doors to make up for that lost amount of funding sylvia what did you think about all the ideas that they had I thought that it was fantastic, really, and it was something, it showed a real imagination and a real understanding of their business. I mean, what was critical was that they understood that the funding was going, they could look at what their costs were, and then they were able to have that time, and it sounds to me as though they really threw themselves into it, uh, to think about all the different things they could do, how they could actually change their business model, all this it's a charity but it's a business model um, and they managed to find a variety of ways in which they could do that 
Um, there's never anything good that comes out of lack of funding, I'm quite sure, for any charities. But if it's a, um, something that people want to hear, I think it's that in adversity, then people have become more creative, and we've seen that over the last few years. Um, businesses are now doing things that perhaps they would never have thought of before. They're working with less and creating more. And that's exactly what happened here. So I think it's a really heartening story. Mm. It's a shame about the funding, but they've actually found a way around it. Well, this idea of funding and charities or social mm. enterprises, it's an important one isn't it because you hit the nail on the head Sylvia you said they are still businesses and they are they may not be generating commercial profit but what they generate goes back into driving what they deliver to their community absolutely I have a lot of clients that are in the charity sector and it's one of the sectors that I work quite heavily in and from my point of view they are businesses um, they have charitable purposes and the output that they have the surpluses go back in and do a fantastic job but there's never been a greater need for charities across the whole range of sectors and there's never been less funding I think coming out directly to them yeah. and this charity has uh, reacted in very much the same way as a lot of charities have to a lesser or greater success but they have all been looking to be more flexible looking at what they already have asking more from people that they're dealing with and understanding um, you know their real business model and it has mm. forced them towards taking that business understanding Ronnie, they had time to prepare, as we've heard and we've just discussed, and obviously that helped. But do you think that's something that all businesses should plan for, the unplanned and the unexpected? I think they should. I, I think perhaps the other way of looking at it is you don't want too many eggs in one basket, and every business needs to remove that concentration of too much income from one source. And whether it's a, an accounting practice or a legal practice or a charity – you have that single source and mm -hmm. we've seen over the past five years how businesses for whatever reason stop you know stop able to produce so you do need to consider as part of your business planning how can I have more eggs in more baskets it's a very important concept although it is also attractive when you have it it does give you a little bit of uh, stability when you have that customer that you can rely on a certain amount of income coming in so you always have that little balance to make don't you Where but use that time wisely when you've got that you think right I've got stability but what if and see if you can then expand your horizons yeah I'm uh, um, you you say Claire about the, the luxury of having that there that client again the other issue of course is you don't want to get too comfortable and assume that those clients will always be with you um, and again having that pipeline of clients that you're developing behind all of the ones that you currently have is just as important isn't it to help build up absolutely critical I think it is exactly <laughs> what you've just said is, is to diversify slightly whether that's in terms of the types of clients or the numbers of clients but yes dependence upon one or two large contracts is lovely because you have a, a nice stream but use it use that time wisely to actually spread further well as ever we're coming to the end of our show would you believe and what i want to make sure of is that we get a chance for you both to give us one last time how people can get hold of you so this time ronnie what's the web address for you right we're on www.efm that's echo freddy mike Dot uk dot com. And Sylvia? It's www.kingstonsmith at. Oh, at <laughs> .co .uk. Sorry, I was doing, doing my email address. Sorry, kingstonsmith.co.uk. Excellent. Well, thank you both so very, very much again thank for you. coming thank on you. tonight. I think we could have had another hour chatting about it all. Um, and a team. So, all, it, all that remains is to round up. What have we learnt tonight? Yeah, well, I mean, I. I, I what I think I learned was that um, you know this this sort of something actually Sylvia both Sylvia and Ronnie sort of said at, um, at the start about self awareness of of people who run businesses in terms of you know if they do become the bottle stopper in their own in their own business actually there's quite a lot that can be done it's not it's not a question in most cases of people not being able to change but actually in a lot of cases people can change with the right kind of interventions and 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 coaching. And I think really it's a lot of people are afraid of finance and money and particularly yeah. people, funnily enough, people that have businesses who really shouldn't be that, that need to, to be instructed and educated in these things. So I think it's always nice to people in the studio that are, that are human, that, you know, <laughs> and... Uh, can speak about and also make a big point about the fact that they don't just provide the advice but they provide support. I think that's very good to know. 
Yes, and I think the key for me is this idea of planning for the unplanned, planning for the unexpected, and not just relying on funding. Well, it's been a very busy show as ever, and um, I think that's pretty much all for the show this week, where we've been discussing how to get fit and stay fit financially. Huge thanks to Sylvia Vitiello from our sponsors, Kingston Smith, and to Ronnie Munster from EFM, Professor Nigel Culkin, Vicky Humber, Daniel Moss, and last but not least, the wonderful Claire McAnulty and Trevor Meriden on the decks. As always, keep your views coming via email and Twitter, but for now, from Claire Trevor and myself it's a very good night <laughs>